Quantum application research is sometimes compared to being a hammer in search of nails. Today, I'd like to tell you about a potentially fertile and understudied nail field. The basic idea is that of quantum-assisted Hamiltonian learning. Let's use a quantum device to infer details of a quantum system from a set of experimental observations, with a potential quantum advantage when the experiments are hard to classically simulate. In what I'm going to describe today, we considered learning molecular structure from a set of nuclear magnetic resonance experiments. Here's the archive link. In the next 10 minutes, I'll dwell briefly into NMR as a quantum experiment, propose quantum circuits to learn the nuclear spin Hamiltonian, and discuss issues with learnability and the potential for quantum advantage. I think most of the audience here knows what NMR is, at least roughly, but everyone likes to be told what they already know. The System 1 studies an NMR as a set of nuclear spins from a molecular material, typically, but not always, in a strong magnetic field. These spins experience three main contributions to their energy. The strongest is typically the interaction with the external field, which in an NMR spectrometer can be up to several hundred megahertz. The second largest is a direct dipole-dipole spin interaction, which for protons can be tens of kilohertz. And the third largest is a coupling of nuclear spins via intermediary electrons, which is on the order of hertz. All three terms depend on system details, the shielding of individual spins, their spatial position, and the surrounding electronic structure respectively. Depending on the system and the experiment, the relative term strength can vary by multiple orders of magnitude, which gives us a very wide area to look for classically intractable systems. Now, an NMR experiment is probably the prototypical quantum experiment. Here I've given a brief description in quantum circuit form. We prepare a system, say by exciting a thermal state, and then we let it evolve by the Hamiltonian below, which contains the interactions I described on the previous slide, plus an external RF field. Finally, we read some observable out of the system, which gives some signal I want to call S of t. The formula for calculating S of t is quite easy to write down, but this is difficult to use for large systems, as it involves time evolving a quantum state. We know in general that this is hard. Now, the problem we want to study is Hamiltonian learning, which is the inverse problem of generating the signal I described on the previous slide. I'll generalize a bit here and consider learning from a set of different experiments which I'm going to label by an index x. And the problem is simple enough to state, given a data set of s sub x of t, learn the unknown coefficients of the Hamiltonian, those h sub n that were described on the previous slide. For simplicity, I'm going to assume everything else in this problem is known, but there's no reason this can't be relaxed. We can think of this idea as if two types of quantum experiments are being run. An experiment experiment in the spectrometer that contains the data we want to learn, but over which we don't have good control, and a simulated experiment on a quantum device that we can control to high accuracy, but which doesn't contain the data we want to learn. I'm going to assume that we can't coherently couple these two experiments, but instead we just want to combine them classically to do our learning. And to learn, let me turn this into an optimization problem with some cost function. Probably the easiest choice of cost function is the log likelihood, which has this form here given experimental uncertainty on each point of signal data. Now, given a cost function, we want to minimize it to solve the problem. And when optimizing, although it's not essential, it helps to have a means for calculating gradients of the cost function. One way of estimating these gradients is to go through the equation for the response of a quantum state at time t to a change in the Hamiltonian parameters. This has a simple form. We take the corresponding Hamiltonian term, evolve it from time s to time t, commute it with the quantum state at time t, and then integrate this over all previous times s. This propagates through to the cost function, which takes a similar form, but here I've offloaded the integral over s to this tilde large case j variable, which integrates over a tilde lowercase j variable. The nice thing about the form of this previous equation was that we can write down a circuit which has an expectation value equal to the lowercase j term on the previous slide. We achieved this using a generalized Hadamard test, which comes at the cost of using one extra qubit to perform this control rotation. We still have to integrate the output of this circuit over s in order to estimate the target gradient, but recall that in a NISC setting, we have to repeat these circuits many times anyway in order to estimate the target expectation values. So, in principle, one can draw S at random for each repetition, effectively performing the integration Monte Carlo style at no additional cost. I'll have to direct you to our paper for more details on the circuit implementation and costing, but we've costed this out relatively comprehensively for both NISC and fault-tolerant implementations of our algorithm. The number of shots per gradient scales is t squared over epsilon squared in NISC, which should be a lower bound given that the gradient itself can scale as order of t. 
In the fault tolerant model we give a total circuit depth, which isn't comparable to the NIST costing on the previous line. The units aren't the same. In a fault tolerance setting, one can use amplitude amplification to gain a saving of t over epsilon, giving a total circuit depth of n times t squared divided by epsilon, times an additional factor that can be made arbitrarily small. To demonstrate that this works, we implemented Hamiltonian learning on a small spic spin cluster. Here, we learned using the conjugate gradient descent algorithm on a classically simulated dataset with simulated sampling noise of 10 to the minus 3 per term. Given this, the algorithm learns 12 couplings within 11 iterations to a total relative error of 0.2%, which seems reasonable to me. Now, let us look towards a potential claim for quantum advantage. This is a problem that we haven't solved in this paper, because although I mentioned previously that the nuclear spin Hamiltonian covers many orders of potential beyond classical problems, we can discard many of these because of two critical issues. The first issue is one of classical competition. NMR has been an essential tool for chemists for 80 years because NMR spectra are often very readily classically solvable. Tools like magical angle spinning or decoupling and recoupling pulse sequences are able to turn off the dipolar coupling terms even in solid state systems, leaving the system weakly correlated and classically tractable to simulate. In order for us to find a quantum advantage, we need to push into the strongly correlated regime where these and find systems for which these methods don't work. But here, we run into the other critical issue. Strongly correlated systems tend to be highly ergodic or chaotic, and chaotic systems tend to not give strong signals to learn from. Indeed, recent results preclude learning scrambling unitaries on a quantum device. This leaves us with a narrow Goldilocks zone for quantum advantage, which I've summarized in this cartoon here on the right. Here, the x-axis is a system ergodicity, and the y-axis is a handle on how much control we have over our experiment. As we increase our control, we can effectively make the system less chaotic and easier to learn. Now, one might wonder what hope we have for finding a useful quantum advantage in quantum-assisted Hamiltonian learning for NMR. What gives me hope here is a large parameter space, but also the fact that greater control allows for both new quantum and new classical experiments, i.e. pushing the gray line up simply pushes its intersection with the green region to the right and doesn't remove it completely. We don't want to use quantum computers to solve problems that are already solved, but we do hope that a quantum computer might open up avenues for new NMR experiments that have been previously discarded as too difficult to interpret. Now, in order to quantify how much we can learn about our system, it is useful to be able to access the Fisher information of our problem. The Cromer-Rau theorem uses this to bound the variance of any unbiased estimator of our parameters. In our case, we are using the log likelihood as a func cost function, and the Fisher information is the second derivative of this when the tilde h are equal to their true values. So, let's extend our previous gradient calculation to get this Hessian. Here's the result. We have this j squared term here, and the product of the estimated signal minus the signal, this time multiplied by a function which I'll call capital K, which is given here. Like the j term, we can estimate the k term, or the lowercase k term, using a quantum circuit, this time with two extra qubits, and again with local control and time evolution. We can play the same tricks with integration to give a total shock count in NISC as t to the fourth over epsilon squared. Again, this should be a lower bound as capital K scales at worst as order t squared. However, I'll note that our, our, at our global optimum, which is at the point we are concerned about for the Fisher information, the second term in the Hessian disappears. So if you wanted to estimate this on a device, you would only need to calculate these j terms, which we would presumably already have if we are doing gradient descent. This is a nice little bonus here. Now, equipped with the Fisher information, we can make direct the connection between learnability and ergodicity, or at least demonstrate strong numerical evidence for this. As an example system, we took the protein ubiquitin and isolated about a hundred small clusters of between five and eight spins within it by just cutting them out from the rest of the protein. Clearly, none of these systems are classically intractable, and we are not yet sure whether ubiquitin in the solid state, i.e. trapped in a membrane, is itself a good candidate for beyond classical simulation. We did this solely as a way of generating a trial set of spin systems that are relevant to NMR. As mentioned previously, in an NMR experiment we have multiple handles on the strength of the dipolar coupling term. The most prominent of these is the ability to physically spin the sample and the ability to create composite decoupling pulses. Rather than simulate these exactly, in this work we assumed the existence of a free parameter to suppress a dipolar term, and we looked at our systems as a function of this suppression. There's a clear phase transition in the system as we tune this suppression factor that starts at around 3 to 4x. 
We can identify this by looking at the wave function fractality, the multifractal dimension, which roughly measures how much of the Hilbert space each of our system eigenvectors explore. The cool thing is, this transition clearly corresponds to an onset of learnability in the system. To see the, this onset of learnability, we visualize the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the Hessian itself. The eigenvectors here correspond to linear combinations of Hamiltonian parameters that are relatively easy or hard to learn, and the eigenvalues are proportional themselves to the rate at which these would be learned. As you can see, in the ergodic regime, these rates decrease exponentially in the system size, while in the fractal regime, the rates are constant in the system size. This means that as we scale to a large system, we will not be able to learn anything in an ergodic system using our given choice of experiments, while in the localized system, we will be able to. Furthermore, in the ergodic regime, each eigenvector corresponds to some global linear combination of parameters corresponding to a large typical participation, which means that what we do learn is highly non-local. In the localized regime, we have a small typical participation, which implies that each eigenvector we learn corresponds to a linear combination of a few local terms. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time anyone has made or suggested a connection between ergodicity and learnability in a quantum system. I would say that this is only numerical evidence, it's not a formal proof. An open problem would be to, fin to formalize this, and we hope to solve this in future work. And yeah, that's about it. Here are the conclusions of this talk, and thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.